you would join me in prayer, please? Father, we thank you that because uh, your son is our cornerstone and because of your great love for us, we can truly say that no matter what is happening in our lives, no matter what's happening in the news, no matter what's happening in our country, in our government, in our society, in our families, in our homes, in our health, in our circumstances, we can truly say that because of our relationship with you, it is well with our soul. Father, I pray that we will all be comforted by that and, and inspired by that. May we now focus on what it is you want us to learn from your work. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to take you back in time to Jerusalem and what was either the year 30 or 33 AD. Scholars disagree on which one. And we won't know that for sure until we get to heaven, probably. But either, and that's not going to be my first question I ask God anyway, but in AD 30 or 33, there was a lot of noise taking place in the streets of Jerusalem as an angry crowd was rushing from the Garden of Gethsemane to the center of the city. Apparently, a young man was awakened by this noise and this tumult and ran out to see what was going on and recognized the man at the center of this angry crowd, that man, of course, being Jesus, who was being taken uh, before Caiaphas and, and before uh, basically some sham trials, sham trials that he'd be railroaded through and then would later be crucified. This young man recognized Jesus, knew Jesus, and was uh, curious as to what would happen and began to follow along. We read this account in the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark in, uh, in chapter 14 and verse number uh, 51 and 52. Now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body, and the young men laid hold of him, and the young men in the crowd, that is. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. This account seems to be out of nowhere in the Gospel of Mark. We don't know. We're not told who this young man is. We're not told what the relevance of the story is. We're not told anything other than what we see here. And then it just continues on with the story of our Lord from that point forward. In fact, none of the other Gospels have this account in it. Mark's Gospel is the only one that records this uh, young man and, and this situation here. And that has led many scholars and theologians to believe that this young man is John Mark himself, that Mark was uh, writing about his own experience and inserting himself into this story here. If that is true, then this is the first mention of John Mark in the Bible. And it is John Mark that I want to speak to you about this morning. I want to share with you some encouraging lessons that we can learn from the life of John Mark. Now, some of you might be thinking, how is John Mark relevant to me? And, and, and unfortunately, pastors, whenever they preach, they have to answer that question, you know, uh, W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me? You know, and it had to do with, what's, this, what's this for me? Uh, well, first of all, anytime the Word of God is open, we should pay attention uh, to that because it's the Word of God. But, but uh, if you want to know, really, practically speaking, why this is relevant to you, why John Mark's story is relevant to you, I have just one question. Have you ever messed up in life? And have you ever messed up, <laughs> okay, uh, have you ever messed up as a Christian since being saved, since following God, you've messed up, and, and you've messed up in such a way that you've let other people down, people that you care about, people that you respect, people that you, that you love and, and look up to, and you've let them down. Well, if, if that's ever been your experience, then you will relate to the story of John Mark, because we're going to talk about that today, and how Mark made a mistake. He made a poor choice. He messed up, and he let a very important leader in the church down, and he let himself down, and I believe he let the Lord down, but God did not give up on John Mark. Just as if you have messed up, God has not given up on you. And we're going to learn today how you can bounce back from a mess up. 
and how you can make your mistake your message and how your legacy need not be bound up in your sins and your disappointments but can be bound up in how you serve Almighty God. That is the story of John Mark, and that's what we're going to look at today. Now, here's what we know about Mark. Uh, uh, the Bible gives us some important details about this young man, and, and uh, Mark was the son of Mary, not Mary, the mother of Jesus, a different Mary. Mary was a very common name in those days. Uh, and uh, uh, so this Mary was a leader in the Jerusalem church. She was a very prominent member, a hostess. She opened up her home to the church members. She was probably a, uh, a um, benefactor of the church. And the fact that she owned a house big enough uh, to uh, uh, host uh, the uh, members of the church for a big prayer meeting, as we see in Acts chapter 12, tells you it's probably a good-sized house, uh, which means that she was probably a lady of some means uh, at the time. And uh, she also um, knew all of the key players in the early church. She was well-connected. Mark grows up in, in this family. He grows up, and, and so he's probably the son of a rich parent, uh, and he is a witness to many of the significant events that take place in early Christian history. And so in, in Acts chapter 12, we're told that, that, that um, John Mark is present at a prayer meeting taking place at his mother's house. It is the first specific mention of John Mark by name in the Bible uh, in Acts chapter 12. Now, this incident in Acts 12 is one of the fun, most fun incidents in Scripture, in my opinion. It's, it's one of the most amusing and entertaining episodes in history, although it comes on the heels of, of a very tragic event. James, a very prominent leader in the early church, has been martyred, has been killed. And the, uh, the early, not too long after Stephen has been stoned to death also, uh, and the early church is now in, in really mourning that loss. And then, before they can even catch their breath, Peter, uh, who is the leader of the church, is seized and thrown into prison. And the, uh, the king at the time, Herod Antipas, wants to have Peter killed. And so, so Peter, uh, now in prison, the church is in turmoil. Uh, the church is feeling the pressure of persecution. So what the church does is something that all of us should do when times get tough. They decide, we're going to pray. And they gather at Mary's house. And Mary brings them all together in her house. However many are there, we're not told, but a lot that are there. And they begin to pray. And then the fun begins. While they are praying, Peter is sleeping in, in the prison, in the jail. What else are you going to do if you're in prison? And so Peter's sleeping, and, uh, which, is, which is neat because Peter is not stressed. You know, he's, not, he's just sleeping. Uh, but the, uh, then there's the greatest jailbreak in history takes place. Um, the angel appears and comes in and knocks Peter upside the head and says, wake up, you know, and then let's go. And uh, Peter's like, okay, you know. So, so, so they walk out of the prison. And then uh, they, they get outside into the, and, into the street, and then the angel's gone. And so Peter's standing in the street, okay, and where am I going to go? You know, and, and, and he decides to go to Mary's house, which tells you a little bit about how important this woman is in, in the church. And so he figures that's where they're praying probably for me, and so he goes to the house, and then a very humorous episode takes place. Mary's servant, which again tells you that she's probably pretty wealthy, uh, answers the door, and uh, uh, and she's ex so excited that Peter has shown up that she runs back and tells everyone that Peter's here, but leaves Peter at the door. Um, and so uh, but Peter eventually makes his way in, and this is a, a happy time for the church. John Mark is a witness to all of this. So that tells you Mark understands the power of prayer. He's seen it up front and personal. He gets the power of prayer. He gets the fact that he, he is, he's a firm believer in Christ, a firm believer in Jesus. He's been raised by a godly woman, and he, he knows that, uh, that Jesus is real, that the Holy Spirit's real, that the power of God is real. He knows all this, and he's passionate about it. So passionate that, that in fact, he's also well-connected because he's the cousin of Barnabas, who is one of the key leaders of the early church. We don't hear as much about Barnabas because Barnabas, didn't, did, to, to our knowledge, did not write any of the epistles in the New Testament. But at the time, in the first century, Barnabas was a very significant leader in the early church, and, and uh, Mark was his cousin. Uh, we, he was also, John Mark was privileged to be a ministry companion at various times to, according to early church history, Peter, and according to the Bible, Paul and Barnabas. And so at various times, Mark served all three of these guys. Uh, and uh, now the significance here, not only is, is Mark kept the privilege to, to meet all three of these giants in the early church, but, but um, I want you to see something that I think all of us can connect with. There are many godly men and women who serve in the shadows. Many godly men and women who never get the stage 
and who don't get a lot of recognition publicly for what they do, but are indispensable to the work of the Lord. Uh, and, and, and if I start naming people now, I'll get in trouble. But let me just say, where would only Baptist Church be if it weren't for the unsung heroes? If it weren't for the people that serve in the shadows behind the scenes, people that work in the AV booth back there, people working in the nursery, people working in children's church right now, people, you know, coordinating behind the scenes in so many efforts, our trustees, you know, uh, our, uh, our, you know, on and on and on, deacons, and people that often don't get as much recognition as perhaps they should, but they serve valuable behind the scenes. They do, they do all kinds of wonderful stuff. You know, Mark uh, was that kind of a guy. He he was not, you know, the preacher and out front and everything, but he served faithfully and, and coordinated all kinds of logistics behind the scenes, made things happen, ran errands, you know, did every, anything that was needed. He was that kind of a ministry companion and assistant. And it's something that all of us can, can relate to. Uh, those of us that are at least serving in church can relate to. Uh, Mark also authored the gospel that bears his name, according to the early church. Uh, now, there are liberal scholars today, and I say, can I say liberal, I mean theologically liberal and progressive um, scholars today that do not believe Mark wrote his gospel. They don't, they, in fact, there are some that don't believe Matthew, Mark, or Luke wrote any of the gospels that they're, that they're named. I am not a liberal. I am a conservative uh, Christian, and, uh, and so theologically, uh, for sure, and I am telling you that Mark did write this gospel, and, it, and we have good, good, solid reason to believe that because the early church from Papias in the early second century on, all are telling us Mark wrote this gospel. And um, Mark was not a direct eyewitness to all of the events in Jesus' life, but uh, the early church tells us that Mark was a companion of the apostle Peter. And while, while he was serving Peter, Mark was Peter's scribe. And so Mark would write down notes on all of Peter's sermons and Peter's preaching and so on and so forth. And Mark took those notes, took, took uh, what Peter told him about Christ and what Peter preached about Christ. Mark took all those notes and put them together in written form, and that became the basis for the Gospel of Mark. And uh, so Peter is the apostle that really stands behind the Gospel of Mark. Now, the uh, Gospel of Mark, I, I jokingly say, but not, not too joking, a lot of seriousness to this, is the Gospel for those with ADD or ADHD. It is the Gospel for those who can't, who don't like to read much. You know, if you're like wondering, how do I read the life of Christ in a way that's not going to take me forever because I'm not a reader, you know, stuff like that. Um, and I'm like, you know, first I'm like, get over it and read it. But anyway, um, if you are the kind of person that just doesn't have the attention span to read much, uh, unless it's like a tweet or a, a Facebook post or, or, or a meme or something uh, or a comic book, you know, but if that, you know, if, if you're like that, then start with the Gospel of Mark. Mark uh, is the shortest of the four Gospels. I mean, Mark moves, man. He doesn't waste time. He just keeps it going, keeps the narrative going. It is an action-packed, very, very fast-moving narrative, you know. I mean, Jesus is on the move in Mark uh, all the time. And so I'd encourage you to read Mark. If, they, if you don't read any other Gospel, you should read them all. But if you don't read, read Mark. Uh, and uh, and I, I haven't timed myself going through Mark yet. I did time myself going through Luke, uh, and Luke took me two and a half hours to read Luke straight through without any breaks. Uh, and so uh, you could probably knock out Mark if you're a reasonably good reader. You could probably knock Mark out in an hour, maybe maybe an hour and a half, maybe if you're slow, if you want to take a bathroom break now and then or something. Uh, but, you know, Mark, Mark, you can you can read. There's no excuse, okay? So that's your homework. Read Mark. All right, so... Mark, uh, uh, Mark's, uh, that, is, that is a legacy. And so Mark, Mark is a guy that's not, at the time, in the first century, he was kind of behind the scenes. But, but God honors him by having him prominently mentioned several times in the book of Acts. And, and of course, we've got the gospel of Mark bearing his name. And so we know how important Mark was is to the early church. Uh, but I want to start with talking about today, really one of Mark's, when Mark messed up, and how we can learn uh, from a mess up. And I want to talk about, you know, how you can recover from a mess up and move forward and still leave a positive legacy for your family, your children, for the church that you serve, your brothers and sisters in Christ, and most importantly, for the Lord. And so uh, in Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 36, we read the story of what happened here. 
Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, as we go through this, I'm going to explain what's going on in the passage. Uh, in, in Acts uh, chapter 15, Acts chapter 15 and verse number 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Mark, uh, rather, uh, Paul and Barnabas had completed their missionary journey. Uh, this was Paul's first missionary journey. They had just completed that, gone around, started churches, helped churches and all of that. And so Paul is saying, let's go back. Let's do it again and let's go and check in on them all. Uh, and again, they didn't have Skype at that time, so you can't like Skype with the people. So you got to go back in person, and, and you got you got you got to wear out. Not I, I was about to say shoe leather. They didn't even have shoes, you know. They had sandals, you know, um, or just bare feet. But they had to go back, and 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 when they wanted to go back and check in on these churches. Uh, but um, the conflict begins uh, in verse uh, thirty-seven. Now Barnabas was determined, determined to take with them. John called Mark, so John Mark. But Paul insisted. This is, this is the setup for a conflict here. Barnabas is determined, and Paul insisted okay, uh, that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. All right, now we have a conflict. Now, this may be hard to, for you to understand, but there are conflicts in church. And uh, this is one of the earliest recorded conflicts in church history. This is a conflict, by the way, and this is, this is something that you all need to understand. Sometimes, godly people can have a conflict. Neither Barnabas nor Paul are carnal Christians here. These men are both godly men. I mean, they, they both love Jesus. They love the Lord, they love people, they love the gospel, and these guys are not cafeteria Christians. They're not the kind of Christians who just sit on the pew and do nothing. These guys are not takers, they're producers, they, they are servants. These guys are serious about their faith. They both love the Lord, and they love each other. So sometimes godly people who even, they love God and they love each other can still have a conflict. And here's the interesting thing. Uh, Luke doesn't have the, Luke does not have the courtesy to tell us who he agrees with. Luke doesn't tell us who he thinks is right. Luke just reports the conflict. And oftentimes, you're going to have a conflict with somebody, and God is not going to come down in, in an appearance and say, you're right, and the other person is wrong. And, and the, uh, the, the angel Gabriel's not going to appear. Kyle and I have a conflict. Angel Gabriel's not going to come down and say, Kyle, the pastor, as always, is right. <laughs> and you are wrong. Say you're sorry, shake, move on. That often doesn't happen in, <laughs> in, uh, in, uh, in conflicts. You know, that doesn't happen. And, and so, uh, it, it, that's never happened in a conflict, you know. It's also not true that I'm always right, so I want to be clear on that. But, <laughs> but Jane will tell you that, too. Uh, but, you know, in, a, in, in conflicts happen, and quite often, they are unresolved this side of eternity. This is a, this is a conflict. Now, there is a degree of resolution later, which we'll get to. I don't want to spoil that yet, but uh, the... Um, but at this stage, anyway, there's a conflict. Luke does not tell us who's right and who's wrong. He just tells us the conflict happened, and he tells us the result of that conflict. I want to give the different perspectives on this conflict right now, uh, and I want to explain a little bit about uh, uh, the fact that, well, one of the interesting things about conflict here. First of all, let's look at, uh, at, the, uh, at the perspective of Paul. Um, now, some people believe that Paul is right, and some people believe that Paul is wrong. Uh, but Paul's perspective is this. He's focused on the work of the Lord. He's focused on getting the work done. Uh, and there, and, and, and let me, let's understand that in a church conflict in particular, there's a time where it has to be said, the needs of the church outweigh the feelings and agendas of a particular individual. And in this case, 
In this case, uh, uh, that, that was the case. That, you know, a great quote from the wonderful theologian, Mr. Spock, um, <laughs> who said, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, still the best Trek film. All right, anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, this is giving you some good Bible this morning. Anyway, so Spock and Paul are on the same page. What pastor in any church is going to say that line today? All right, so uh, Paul and Spock are on the same page here. And, and so Paul is saying, look, there is work to be done. And he's basically saying, in all seriousness, I can't trust Mark. Mark abandoned us, and that's the mess up. Mark abandoned us. We needed him. And, and you read back earlier, Mark came along with them on that team. He was on that missionary team, Paul and Barnabas and Mark. And he dropped out. We'll come back to that in a minute. And Paul's like, I need someone I can count on. And many of you that have been in leadership positions, you know how important that is. You need to be able to count on somebody. And if someone's going to make a commitment, you've got to count that they're going to follow that through. That they're not going to quit when things get a little bit dicey, when things get a little bit tough. And if I may, may say, ministry is hard. Ministry is tough. Ministry is, involves people. And people are complicated. And people can be challenging. And ministry, in the Christian sense, involves spiritual warfare. And the devil takes no prisoners, ladies and gentlemen. He devours people. And when you, when you launch into ministry, you're going to be under spiritual attack. And you're going to have conflicts with other people. And you're going to have disappointments. And other people are going to let you down. And you sometimes are going to let yourself down. It's tough. It's hard. And the people that, that are most effective in ministry are the people that stick to it, that stay with it, that recognize this is my call, I'm here to serve God, and I'm going to see this through. And, and that was not, at this time, John Mark. And Paul needed a go-to person. He needed someone that he could count on, and that was not Mark. And so Paul's like, nope, not taking him. Now, if Paul was just referring to this next trip, this is, my, this is the Brian Tubbs opinion on this, okay? And you could take it for the literal two cents that it's worth, okay? If, if Paul was saying, I don't ever want to have anything to do with Mark again, then that would be overly harsh and Paul would be in the wrong, in my opinion. But if Paul was saying simply, nope, not right now, he's not ready, I'm not taking him on this trip. If that was what Paul was saying, then I think Paul's got a very good point there. Now, Luke doesn't give us enough information to say for certain. Luke just tells us Paul didn't want Mark on this trip. And, and Paul has a point. But Barnabas also has a point. Barnabas's perspective is, this is his cousin. This is family. And it's not just that. It's not just sticking with your cousin, sticking with your family. But Barnabas knows Mark. Think about that. Barnab who, knows, who knows Mark better, Paul or Barnabas? Bar this is Barnabas knows Mark better, and Barnabas sees potential in Mark. Not only that, but Barnabas, something about Barnabas' character and, his, and his, the way his nature, Barnabas always looks for the best in people. Barnabas is known today as the encourager. Barnabas is the guy that encouraged the church, and that was his gift. He had the gift of encouragement, and he used it to serve God. And so M Barnabas is always about encouraging people, hey, you failed, but get back up. Let's go. You can do this. Barnabas is that guy that you love to have on your side. He's the guy that you love to have you cheer you up. If you're down and depressed, Barnabas is the one you want to pick up the phone and call. Barnabas is the one that he, he, can, he can give you a pep talk and get you back in the game. And that's Barnabas. And so Barnabas is not ready to give up on Mark. Barnabas sees great potential in Mark. And guess what? The Bible, if you continue to read forward, bears that out. We see Mark's potential really emerge in the future. And so you see Bar Barnabas has a point too. And Paul is a little quick to give up on Mark from Barnabas' perspective. And, um, and so who's right in that conflict? And here's, here's, the, here's the, the interesting thing. When you've got two godly people who do love, both love the Lord, they both love each other, and they have a conflict, quite often they both have good points. Now that, that kind of twists around the axle, doesn't make some, hmm, 
But, you know, when you think about it, I, there's very rare that I've been in conflicts with fellow Christians, extremely rare. In fact, as I'm thinking right now, I can't think of any, <laughs> um, where I'm 100% right and the other person's 100% wrong. That oftentimes when you have conflict between two godly people, they both have good points. They just, we just struggle in this fallen world and our fallen flesh to sometimes work that through in, in, as, as God would have us to. And so both Paul and Barnabas have good points here, but let's look at John Mark's perspective. And this is a perspective that we rarely see, but I, I, I want us to uh, try to connect with Mark here. Uh, in order to do that, we'll go to the next, uh, the next uh, verse here. Um, then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. Uh, and he went through Syria and uh, Sicilia, strengthening the churches. So um, this is the outcome of the conflict. But I want you to think about how Mark must feel at this point. Remember, Mark's raised by a godly woman. He's in a, raised in a Christian home. He's well connected with the leaders of the church. He wants to serve God. He wants to dedicate his life to service. He goes on an exciting missionary journey, but then he drops out halfway through. And then uh, here now, he's being invited by his cousin anyway to go back on a second missionary journey. And Paul, a man he respects, no doubt, and looks up to, no doubt, Paul says, nope, not going to happen. Have you ever been rejected before? Have you ever disappointed someone to the point that they were not ready to forgive you or not ready to give you another chance? That they were not ready to trust you? And how did that make you feel? And deep down, you feel, hey, I'm worthy of that trust. I'm worthy of being given a second chance. I deserve, you think, I deserve, I, they should forgive me. They should accept me for who I am. They, they should love me because I love them. And the person just walks away. That's what Mark is feeling right now. He's been rejected. And if I can put it in modern terms from a, from a career standpoint, and I don't look at ministry like in the same way as a career as anything else, but this is a career ender to have Paul blacklisting you, okay? I mean, think about that. The Apostle Paul is not a good reference for you. How would that look like? You know, you're trying to get a job with another missionary team, and that missionary team, that missionary organization calls Paul. Paul, can you recommend John Mark? John Mark's applying here. Nope, stay away from that guy. Hmm. So this is, a, this is a, not a good thing for Mark. Mark's in a tough position right now. So from an emotional standpoint, I hope we can all relate that, that Mark's, Mark's in a low point. But here's something about messing up, and this is, before you get, we get to the good news, we've got to understand the bad news here. The Bible tells us that there is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus and to those who walk according to the flesh and not according to the Spirit. That's Romans 8, verse 1. That's the good news. The good news is, hey, if, you're, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're under the grace of Almighty God. Jesus has covered you by His blood. And so when the Father looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees God. He sees his grace through his son, Jesus Christ. And that's powerful, and that's great news. But we also have to accept the fact that there is some bad news here. Sin has consequences. And there is something in Galatians 6 called sowing and reaping. And when you sin, you are sowing bad seed. Paul uses an agrarian analogy that everyone in the first century could relate with. And Paul says, when you, when you make a bad choice, a bad decision, when you make a mistake, when you do something wrong, you are sowing bad seed. And that bad seed will bring bitter fruit. And you will reap that bitter fruit. You will reap the consequences of your bad choices. Now that happens for the unsaved and for the saved. It happens for people, uh, in fact, you may be unsaved, sowing bad seed, then you get saved. Humanly speaking, you're still, you still got to reap some of that bitter fruit. There's still consequences for your sin. And, and uh, God's grace does not eradicate all those consequences. God may reduce some of those consequences as, as a grace and mercy to you, 
but we still live in the kind of fallen world that you're still going to reap the consequences from your own sin. There's consequences for John Mark's failure here. There's broken trust. And those of you that know when someone has broken your trust, it takes time to work through that healing. It takes time. And you can't expect the other person to say, all right, that's fine, I get it. No, no sweat, no big deal, it's okay. You know, when you, when you really let someone down, it's not okay. It's not okay. And, it, and, and, and there's pain that's caused there. And there has to be some time given to deal with that and to let that other person work through that. And in fact, they may never get up to the point where they can be your best friend. And that's okay. You know what? It's okay. Not all Christians have to be best buddies with one another. And so Paul was not ready to trust Mark. And even though that crushed Mark, no doubt, emotionally, even though that hurt his feelings big time. Mark had to live with that. Mark had to own those consequences. Now, this doesn't mean that Mark was out of the ministry, that God didn't have any use for Mark at that point. It didn't mean that at all. But it did mean there was broken trust with Paul because of what Mark did. And Paul is not sinning to have some trust issues with Mark. Mark would be unreasonable to demand, hey, Paul, get over it. Jesus died for my sins. I'm sorry I let you down, but hey, you've got five seconds to get over it or, or you're sinning against God. That's not how that works. That's not how that works. There was a gentleman many years ago that I know, he was in the ministry, and he committed a major sin, major enough that law enforcement got involved in the courts and everything, and it decimated the church that he was serving. He was not the senior pastor, but... He was serving in on staff there, and he uh, decimated, the, decimated the church, major damage. And um, later, the senior pastor allowed him to say a few words to the church, and it was supposed to be an apology. But instead, he, he apologized, but then he began to tell the people, listen, the Bible says you're supposed to forgive me. That did not go well. <laughs> that did not go over well. I wasn't there at the meeting. I, I wasn't there, but I heard about it later. That did not go over well. And in fact, one of the uh, individuals, one of the leaders in the church stood up and said, look, I understand I got to forgive you as a Christian, but I don't appreciate you telling me that. When you sin, understand you owe a debt. This is biblical theology here. We're supposed to, God tells us to forgive our debtors, right? But there's, humanly speaking, when you sin against another human being, you owe a debt. And yes, God says that the person that you've sinned against is supposed to forgive that debt. But you don't have the right to demand that person forgive that debt. You owe the debt. It's like, I can't call up the credit card company and say, I know, yes, I, I, know I owe you money, but Jesus died for my sins, so, so my balance should be zero, right? All right, so um, I don't get to do that, you know? That is, it's not realistic. When you sin, you owe a debt. And you've got to owe that. You've got to own that consequence. And when you sin and you let people down, there's broken trust there, and you have to accept that. And you can't just look at someone and say, hey, I am the way I am. I've got this issue. I've got that issue. I'm Irish. I'm redheaded. I'm whatever. You know, and, uh, you know, I've got this. I've got that. You know, and, 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 and they should just understand it. It doesn't work that way. Whatever the, whatever the reasons are, if you've let someone else down and hurt someone else, you've caused pain. And you've sown bitter seed, and a bitter fruit is going to be reaped there. And depending on who you've hurt, that other person may be reaping the, the bitter fruit of your seed that you, that you sown. Uh, some, sometimes the sins of other people affect us. A lot of times it does. And so um, there, there, it, there are consequences to sin. And, and that is something that John Mark needed to learn. And I want you to think about this. If, if, if there were no consequence to sin, would we ever grow? God uses pain to grow us. This is a hard thing. But he uses consequences and conflicts quite often to grow us. And Mark responded in a godly way, as we will see. Now, let me finally close out on this conflict with God's perspective. You know who wins in this whole thing? is God. God wins on this. Um, because 
there, were, there was one missionary team, then there was a conflict, and at the end of the conflict, there are two missionary teams. And so from God's perspective, and this is important to remember, what's most important to God? What's most important to God is that sinners come to repentance, you know, and he's rescuing people from, from the, the clutches of the enemy. That's what's most important to God. And so now there's two missionary teams going out. You know, Romans 8, the promise there, all things work together for good to them who love God and to them who are called according to the purpose. That promise is seen here. God works this out for his good and his glory here. Because even though there's this conflict between these two godly brothers over another guy that's also godly but made a mistake, God wins. And we've got this guy named Silas that pops up here. And now Silas gets the opportunity to travel with Paul. And Silas gets the opportunity to grow as a Christian. God wins in so many different ways here. So conflict, even though I, I'll be honest with you, I'm human. I hate conflict. I hate it. But I have known, I have learned, I'm learning <laughs> that God doesn't always hate conflict in the same way. That sometimes God uses conflict to grow us, and sometimes God uses conflict to multiply his ministry. And that's certainly the case here. But this is not the end of Mark's story. One of the most beautiful passages in Scripture is found at the end of 2 Timothy. Paul, at this point, is toward the end of his life. In the book of 2 Timothy, he's He's seeing the, the very near likelihood of his execution, and he's alone. He's in prison. He's alone, and, and all these people have left him, and some of them have left him because they are, they are serving God. And in some cases, he sent some people away to run some errands for him, but he's still alone, other than Luke. He says, Luke is with me. But other than that, others have left him, including Demas that he refers to. Demas had been a fellow laborer uh, with Paul, but Paul says in the verse before, Demas has forsaken me. It's interesting, you see a little bit about Paul's heart and Paul's emotions here. Demon, he doesn't say Demas forsook the Lord. Demas has forsaken me. He's left me. That gives you an idea, by the way, of the pain that Paul felt when Mark left him early on. But look at this beautiful verse. In this letter, he's writing to Timothy. He asked Timothy to come. He asked Timothy to bring his cloak. Paul's human. It's just neat to see the humanity of these guys. And it says, bring the books, bring the parchments and stuff. But in the middle of that, Paul says this, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. This is the journey here. Back in Acts, Paul didn't want Mark coming along because he didn't think Mark was useful. You couldn't depend on Mark. Years later, Paul's in prison. Paul's doing the work of the Lord. And he says, get Mark. I want to see Mark. He's useful to me in ministry. I want you to think how Mark felt when Timothy comes to him and says, Hey, Paul wants you to come with me and go see him. He needs you. I want you to think what that meant to Mark. This is beautiful reconciliation here. But Mark earned Paul's trust back. You see, the legacy of Mark is not that he messed up and stayed there. Many Christians fall down and stay there. Many Christians will fall down and keep flirting with the same sin over and over again and falling over and over again. Many Christians will give up because they feel it's too late. I've let too many people down. I've let God down too many times. It's done. And that could have been the end of Mark's story, but it wasn't. That was the, what we call in the movies the inciting incident for Mark. And Mark took that and said, I'm not doing that again. And he began to serve even more faithfully. He learned the lesson that God wanted him to learn. And he re-earned Paul's trust. Not only that, but you see that, that Mark uh, actually uh, was uh, loved here. Peter refers to Mark as his son. That's a very affectionate title. It's basically Peter saw Mark as his son in the ministry, his spiritual son. Uh, we, we don't know who uh, Mark's biological father was. We know Mark was raised by a godly woman. It's, it's likely that the father had passed away early on. And so basically Mark had like a, a, a being raised by a single mom who did a wonderful job with him. Uh, but, but Peter became like a father figure to Mark. Imagine having Peter as your father figure, you know. Peter as your mentor. And, and Peter's referring to Mark as his son. 
And again, this is more an indication of the relationship they had and how Mark wrote that gospel with Peter's, uh, based on Peter's teachings and preaching. Um, and then Paul refers to uh, Mark in, in the book of Philemon as a fellow laborer, as a fellow laborer, and then as we just saw in 2 Timothy, is useful to me for ministry. And so we see Mark, um, again, having re-earned Paul's trust um, and that restoration. Uh, Mark, later, according to early church tradition, this is not in Scripture, but this is based on early church history. Uh, Mark leaves eventually for Egypt and founds the Coptic church in Egypt. And the Coptic Christians in Egypt uh, honor Mark to this day. They, they look up to him, and they consider Mark their founder. And uh, while he's there, uh, he is, uh, according to the accounts, he is... Uh, dragged by, uh, he, he's grabbed by a pagan mob, tied to a horse, and dragged to his death uh, while, he's, while he's there. Uh, uh, and uh, Mark, uh, that may seem like, well, that's terrible, that's a bad way to end your life, but that's not the end of Mark, uh, because that was the end of Mark's life on this earth. But you, uh, lo- no, notice, that, notice how Mark is praised by Peter. Mark here has already been praised and affirmed by his cousin Barnabas. Mark is praised by Paul, a guy who had kind of given up on him, and now Paul is calling him to his side. And then Mark dies. He dies, and he receives the best praise of all, when undoubtedly he wakes up in the presence of the Lord and hears, well done, good and faithful servant. That is John Mark's story. He messed up, but he got back on his feet. He served faithfully earning back the trust of the man he let down, and most of all, earning the approval and the affirmation of his heavenly Father. But what about you? And that's what I want you to think about today. I'll be honest with you, um, this was not the message I was supposed to preach today, at least in my opinion. (laughs) I, uh, I, uh, I had a whole other message prepared, but it was like, I was like knocking my head against the wall. I wasn't, wasn't feeling it, and I don't base truth on feelings, don't, don't misunderstand, but you know, I pray about the messages, and I pray about what, what the Lord wants me to do, and the message that I had just felt lifeless, just felt like, yeah, you know, and I would try, I'd try well, I'll just put some cool illustrations in there, and I'll put, you know, and it was like knocking my head against the wall, I was forcing, it just wasn't happening, and I just felt, I just felt the name John Mark came to my head, and, and it's like, and it's weird, it's like, and, and, and I just felt this certainty, and it's like the Holy Spirit saying, that's what you're going to preach on, you're going to preach on Mark. And I, I didn't even know where that sermon would go when I first began to prepare it. But I feel like I'm standing before you now. I feel confident that this is the message God wanted me to share with you today. And I believe that there's someone here, maybe more, maybe a few, that needed to hear this. That, you know, you can, one, be a faithful servant, and other people may not recognize that you're a faithful servant. You may be in the background, in the shadows, like Mark was most of the time. But you can still be indispensable to the work of the Lord. Your work matters because the ultimate approval that matters is not the approval of your fellow man or woman, but the approval of God Almighty. But the second thing is, you can mess up. You can mess up royally. It's, it's hard to beat the mess up that, that, that Mark did. I mean, he made a commitment to Paul. Imagine messing up with Paul and letting Paul down. Of all the people that I would not want to let down, Paul would be at the top of that list. But Mark let Paul down. And, and, and he messed up, but he didn't give up. And I want to ask you right now, maybe you're in the middle of a mess up. Maybe you're recovering from a mess up. And I want to ask you, are you ready to give up? You don't have to give up. God did not give up on Mark, and God is not giving up on you. So just get back off the mat. Dust yourself off. Make amends as best you can for, for the hurt that you've caused. And understand that you may have to endure and live with some consequences for that pain. And that's okay. It's okay. We all have to reap what we sow. But just because you've got to deal with some pain and some hurt and owning up some consequences does not mean that God has given up on you. I know men and women who have served faithfully in ministry, and they messed up big time. And God is still using them today. They may not have the same level of luster, so to speak. They may not have the same uh, platform that they once did. They may be somewhat diminished from the world's standpoint. But you know what? God can still use them, and God can still use you 
your main purpose here is to serve and glorify God. And you need to glorify God when you're on the mountaintop. You need to glorify God when you're in the valley. You need to glorify God when you're doing well. And you need to glorify God after you've royally messed up. Because guess what? If God has the power to raise his son from the dead, God can turn your mess up into a message that can impact other people for him. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I thank you for the fact that you didn't give up on me. I thank you for the fact that despite all my flaws and shortcomings, that you used me. Father, I thank you that um, we don't have to be perfect to be used by you. You're not interested in a resume. You're interested in a heart. So, Father, I just, uh, I just pray that, that, that we will have the heart of John Mark here. And we will learn from our mistakes, accept the consequences of those mistakes, but still continue to serve you. Knowing that in the end, you're the one that's the ultimate judge. And you're the one that will determine our legacy. And you're the one that will determine whether we're in the right and the wrong. Lord, we just need to serve you. And so, Father, if there's anyone here today that just needs some encouragement from, from like your servant Barnabas would give and say, hey, get back off the mat. Keep serving. If there's anyone here today that needs that or needs some prayer, this invitation is for them. Father, if there's anyone here today that needs to make a decision to rededicate their life to you or to you know, enter into a relationship with you for the very first time, Lord, this invitation is for them. Father, but most of all, this invitation is for you. We, we give it to you. We ask it that you just glorify it and we give it to you in your honor and glory. We ask that you just bless our time at this, at this point, Lord, as we reflect on what you'd have us to learn from this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You'll please stand.